This is Friday, February 14, 2020. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Allison Doc Blaney. Welcome, Al. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? Born uh, the 10th of March, 1925, in Woodstock, New Brunswick, Canada. And what town do you live in now? I live now in Natick. Okay. Your marital status? I'm a widower. Do you have children? I have three. Two boys and one girl. Do you have grandchildren? Yeah, I have, uh, let's see, two, four, five, five grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Now, you told me before the interview you lived in New Brunswick for the first 11 years. Yeah. And what happened after? Well, my brother was a minister and I was living with him, and he came from New Brunswick to a church in uh, Fairfield, Maine. So I came with him. From, we went from there to Elliott, Maine. And uh, I uh, lived in Elliott, Maine until uh, my 18th birthday when I, uh, went to the uh, people and told them I wanted to go on the next bunch of guys. Mm -hmm. So I went uh, on the 23rd of May of uh, 1943. I was sworn into the military. And what branch? I was in the army at that branch. And why the Army? Well, most of the young fellows I knew around there were going. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had tried when I was 17 to go into the Navy, but they wouldn't be taking, taking me because mm -hmm. I was a Canadian citizen. Mm -hmm. So I had to wait till the draft. So you graduated from high school and then... No, I oh, didn't, didn't finish high school. Really? Got a GED. Okay. And before we continue, where is Elliott, Maine? Hmm? Where is Elliott, Maine? Oh, the first town we lived in was Fairfield. Yeah. And then we moved to Elliott. And where is Elliott? In Maine, right by Kittery. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, you're now in the Army with several of your, of your buddies. Uh, where were you sent for basic? I went down to Pickett, Virginia, Pickett, uh, Virginia for basic. And, and after basic, mm -hmm. uh, in September of 43, I went to England. What was basic like? It was actually, it was just to uh, learn how to stop blood bleeding on any of the uh, wounds. So that's where you learn how to become a medic. Yeah. Okay. Now you're in Virginia, another part of the country during the war. Uh, what was that like meeting other people from other parts of the country? Well, uh, I didn't like it in Virginia. We weren't allowed to go into the town. And I uh, found out later that the town didn't even have uh, war, uh, nothing but mud roads. And uh, so I was glad to get out of there. So in September 1943, you're heading off to England. Uh, were you sent 
to, uh, via convoy boats? Yeah, no, we went uh, all alone. It was a big, uh, used to be uh, tr for travel cruises, and there was about 4,000 of us. What was that like? I didn't mind it. I had a good time because uh, I had learned mm -hmm. to stay outside instead of being inside because the smell in there was... So I stayed outside most of the time. Yes, hanging out with 4,000 people in a confined space. I can understand uh, how yeah. it could get so smelly. And did you, uh, when you're heading to England, were you going zigzag to avoid the subs? Yeah, no, we were zigzagging mm -hmm. every 10 minutes. And we ended up in Liverpool. Okay. How long did it take you to get from? Five days. Five, that's not bad. No. Okay, from Liverpool, what happened next? Well, that was just where we docked. We got on the train from there. Then we went down to Birmingham in England. Now, Al, at this point, what was your rank and were you attached to any uh, regiment yet? No, I wasn't attached to any. It was just a regular uh, medical company and I had uh, PFC, one strike. So what happened in Birmingham? Well, from there, uh, I wasn't there very long because uh, two of my buddies and I had written an notice on our bulletin board that uh, they wanted paratroopers. And uh, we were the jokers of the outfit. Because when you where you saw one, you saw the other two, and uh, we went and volunteered for the paratroopers. Then uh, went with the British paratroopers. Well, that's where we took our basic, and they were. Bugger, excuse the okay. buggers, <laughs> because all of them had been combat already, and they knew what to do. They were hard, and there were, out of the total 300, there were about uh, 25 from uh, U.S., and there was only three of us that. Uh, <laughs> Us three guys. So when you were being trained to be a paratrooper, this was more than just jumping out of a plane. You had to oh, learn. Yeah. Well, I had all had uh, training how to kill with your hands. All and even though we were medics, they tossed us with the rifles and everything. Mm -hmm. Had all that and. Uh, then it came jump time, and we were jumping out of British bombers. They didn't have the craft that we did. So we finished that up, and then we went back to outfit in Birmingham mm -hmm. to, get the, to get our orders. How long were you in like paratrooper training? Training we was in three months. Okay, so now and you're back in Birmingham. This takes us now to where um, early '44. Yeah. We stayed there. I stayed there longer, but the other two boys stayed two weeks. But uh, when we got back to Birmingham, we decided to go out and have elbow exercise. <laughs> and uh, I, the very next day, I ended up in the hospital 
with spinal meningitis. How long were you in the hospital? I was in there for three months, but uh, I didn't get out legally. And my two buddies had already been down to our uh, 326 medical, and uh, they came up to see me when I got out of the contagious ward. And they told me, we're going behind the wire. In other words, we, they went in an area, we went in the wire, nobody come in, nobody out, no mail, no nothing. And they told me they were going to do that. It would have been on the uh, 2nd of June. So uh, when they came up on the 1st, I told them, well, we come up tomorrow, bring my jump boots, my jump there, where, and uh, come in an ambulance. So uh, when we left, I got in the ambulance and went in, went out. And no one signed you out or anything? You just took off? Well, I went out of and then, uh, of course, I had to take three, four jumps for the, our badge and my five, fifth jump to get the badge was into Normandy. While you were recovering from spinal meningitis and getting snucked out on an ambulance, uh, did you or anyone within your immediate circle know that an invasion was coming? No, they, nobody knew that they were coming for me. And it was just, hey, they came into the hospital with guard, and since, since they had the ambulance, they just passed them on through. But, uh, so I went out. And after we got into Normandy, came back to England, my company commander called me in. He says, you're in trouble. I says, is that anything new? He said, no. <laughs> he says, did you walk out? Or how did you get out of, out of the hospital? I said, I rode out in an ambulance. <laughs> and he, I got the letters here looking for you at the hospital. And he says, if you were crazy enough with all of that to come with us, he says, I burned the letters. So he burnt the letters for me. Never heard another word out of it. Ah, so you're now on your way to Normandy before, of course, your commanding officer burns the letters and stuff, but you're, you're actually there. And uh, which beach did you land on? Hmm? Which, which beach at, along Normandy? We, we, we didn't land on any beach. Uh -huh. We lasted uh, about five kilometers behind Utah. Utah. Our main uh, destination, there was three uh, water going through. We had to get those three ones and uh, then get in Carantan. <laughs> that was our uh, duty that time. And as paratroopers, what was your assignment? Just my assignment was, I, of course, I jumped with them just to take care of the wounded. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, immediate aftermath of Normandy, they must have kept you very busy. 
Yeah, we were busy. And uh, of course, it turned out that even if he was a German, we would still take care of him. We done the both. They done the both for us. Now, uh, in the nineties, oh, I took the wife over, and uh, we were in Carantan, and uh, I had made friends with a French captain, paratrooper. He was standing on the other side of the room with this man, and he made, waved me to come over. So I went over, he induced, introduced me, come in an entire conversation, found out our both aid stations were about one kilometer away. And we were taking care of his, we, would, we had a special uh, flower of the Buddha, and we would trip back and forth. And he told me, he said, if you ever come into Germany, he says, and I find out that you were within a hundred miles, he says, I'm going to come after you. And he says, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. Did he keep his promise? <laughs> no. Because, because uh, after uh, World War II, I re-enlisted and uh, they saw my medical record, I had spinal meningitis, no more jumping. So I went Air Force uh, in, into the intelligence. Okay. Al, let's get you back a couple of years, back to Normandy. How long were you stationed at that particular location? No, we weren't stationed. We well, were, just there. Huh? We, they had areas where they had troops, but mm -hmm. the medics went out every, mm -hmm. on everything. But you di did eventually get back to England. Yeah. Okay. And that's when your commanding officer burned the papers. What happened after that? After that, we went, uh, let me see, they told us when we went in Normandy, if we'd given three days of hard fighting, that we would be pulled out and back into England. Turned to be 39 days. And then uh, on the 16th of December, of September, we uh, went into uh, Holland, mm -hmm. jumped into Holland, and I worked there partly in a part time on out the line, and part time in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, as a medic on the line, what kind of equipment would you have? We the only thing we would have is we'd have little morphine things, and all of the bandage, and the uh, medication we needed, but we had no weapons. Mm -hmm. We did have a trench knife, just in case we needed it, but if the Nur German got to, we'd throw it away. Therefore, they couldn't, but the German SS, we had uh, markings on our helmet. They were using that for, for uh, targets. So we got rid of them. So you're now in Holland. Yeah. And After Holland, mm -hmm. we was there until, uh, oh, I think it was the 10th of November. Mm -hmm. And then on the 19th, we went into battle. We went into the Battle of the Bulge. And on the 
20th, they'd set our hospital up, tents. Uh, and uh, our commander of the uh, medics told the division commander, he says, this is not a good risk. Good. We want to do. Commander says, "You do it." So within 12 hours, they were overrun by the Germans. And uh, but I was fortunate. I had been doing ambulance work that day. And. Uh, Went in the bathroom and come out, mm -hmm. headed back to the hospital. And uh, another ambulance was coming toward me. He stopped me. He says, "Don't go." Then everything has been taken. So I was fortunate enough. Mm -hmm. That's why I stayed with the divisional medics until uh, we ended up down in Beatrice Garden. What do you remember most about that particular period? Uh, do you, are there any memories of that particular period? I mean, I heard it was very cold, very snowy. Oh, yeah. We had snow knee deep. And a lot of our boys had frostbite on their feet. And if a person usually it was not able to do it, but if they were, had been wounded and we couldn't get it close enough, they'd froze to death. But uh, on the 20th or 21st, we then Bastogne got surrounded. And uh, German came over with white wanting to surrender. Well, our commander was a character. And when he, when he said that, he saw oh, nuts. So then it was decided that's what they would tell the Germans, nuts. Mm -hmm. So uh, all over Bastogne you'll see nuts. And he went out and was asking some of the men what they thought about the other. One of the fellows spoke up and says, oh, poor bastards, they got us round, surrounded, but not for long. <laughs> Al, do you remember seeing the American airplanes flying overhead, the Allied craft? You remember all the, uh, the the American airplanes flying over? Yeah, and uh, for Normandy, we uh, all of us we got up. They give us an order to get up, and then have, and have a hook up to the line, and then the guard shoots your automatic. Well, one of the fellows, when we get lined up, where he had been sitting. A shell came up, and we looked at the same thing. The uh, engine was on fire, and the uh, pilot told the crew to get us out. And we were supposed to have gone out at over, uh, about 800 feet. Mm -hmm. We went out to the, our lowest, the last man got out at 400. And, uh, and by that, Shoot it just barely open when they land. Was he okay? Yeah, he. Wow. He made it. So I was just, uh, I was referring to when you, got, you folks were in Baston, surrounded by the Germans, and the commanding officer saying nuts. That shortly after you. Uh, from other accounts, you're seeing all these planes flying over. They were dropping supplies in mm -hmm. for us. 
because it got down that our, our retillery, they only had one shell left. Until they got that resupply. That was close. No, we were. And, uh, but the uh, people in Bastogne, they, one of the ladies went all through the town and got us sheets so we would have white. We wouldn't stand out so much in the, against the snow. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years later, I don't remember who it was, but I read about it. He went and got sheets for every family and took them over and gave them to them. Now, I found out my whole career, no matter where I went, if you treat the people like people, you, they're going to, uh, you're not going to have any problems. Because after, uh, after I'd read, uh, I went to Korea and uh, met, a man, I met a man who in charge of the building we were in, uh, Jap, and he said, I've got tea for you boys, anything you want. And I got talking to him. He invited me over to his house for supper. And uh, I don't know. It was just a, it's a life is what you make it. I've heard so many people say that, well, the military made me do this. The military made me do this. Uh -uh. Like smoking, a lot of the guys blame being in the military. But I have never taken one puff in all my whole life. Well, let's get you back on the road to Germany. Battle of the Bulge is behind you now. You said your units were on your way to Birch's Garden. Now, what was that like? Now, we're talking early 1945. Well, uh, it was uh, a lot of us medics were taken away and gone into these concentration camps. And uh, I was in the medical group that we uh, were the first into two different, uh, and that was, you wonder how the first people were live, living. And of course, they were dying by the hundreds every day. And they were just taken over to where the furnaces were, stack them for, like uh, wood. And uh, the odor was rotten all the way. And uh, I took the wife over uh, and uh, we went down into uh, one of the camps. And uh, she looked all around. She says, it's quiet. Yeah, quiet. But she says, what else? I, said, I can still smell them. Believe it or not, it's, it's getting way back here. Mm -hmm. Al, I know I appreciate you ex sharing these experiences with us. I know it's kind of hard even now yeah. to recount these. Yeah, it is. Uh, a few years ago, I had uh, shingles in my right arm, use it. And they gave me oxygen, oxy that oxygen, mm -hmm. and I had to stand by the bed I immediately knocked me out. 
my wife told me, she says, you know, you talked a lot about the war. I said, I did? She says, yeah. And, uh, but, uh, no, after I got out of service and gone to Germany, came back, ended up in Maine, and uh, went to a dance with him, my buddy one night, new friend. And I saw this girl standing there. And I walked up, asked her for the dance. She said, yeah, well, after the dance, I took her back where she was, went over with my buddy. I said, you know, it'd be funny if I, if I married that girl. I did. <laughs> <laughs> And she told me years later, she said, you know, I've been keeping this secret too long. She said, you know, when you walked away from me after that first dance, she said, I said, that's the man I'm gonna marry. And the thing is this, mm -hmm. I could not walk her home for the first two weeks. I'd have to leave her to dance. She says, I don't do that. And I said, well, all right. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, one time, after we'd been going together a while, her mother and father went to a dance with us. During uh, intermission, he said, let's go get a beer. So I said, okay. So I went, oh, we got a beer for him and me, Coke for them. She looked at me. She said, you drink that beer? She says, I'm done. So stupid me, I grabbed his, downed it, grabbed mine, walk, walked out, to see you later. Three months later, her dad called me. I hadn't seen her in at all. And uh, he said, uh, my sister's got, got some carpentry work. Could you come down? I said, yeah. Well, I walked in. There she's standing. <laughs> and we went out, out so this is the wintertime, went outside, stood by a fence, talked for three hours. Then I gave her a kiss. That was it. <laughs> how, uh, how it happened? No, she didn't want me drinking. So I usually had two beers before I went to bed. That was it. She didn't want any of it. So that was it. Wow. And I so don't know how she ever put up with me <laughs> all the years she they did. Mm -hmm. She'd been in an accident in uh, no uh, oh four, and uh, had in head injury, and uh, I kept her home for as long as I could. And in two thousand twelve, I took her up to a nursing home in. Uh, Oh, Marlboro, and uh, she was there for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. But to, up to the last year, I could go in, hold her hand. She she didn't even know it. And uh, I after that, I went this way. I went so far down. That I went to see my doctor one on the, due to the fact I'm military, I still have to have exams at least twice a year. So I went to my doc doctor. He said, "What's the trouble?" I said, "Nothing." He said, "Something is wrong with you. What is it?" I said, "Nothing." I said, "I just feel I'm living in a." Back black tone, nothing in there but 
one door to get out. And over that door, it said death. Woohoo! He put me on medication. I'm still on it, but mm -hmm. but it's been a wife for life. Mm -hmm. She, as far as I was concerned, was the uh, military wife. Because every time we had, well, let's see, it was in Virginia, went to Maine. Oklahoma, Alaska, and then back from Maine. And uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. Never heard a squawk out of her. And yet some of the other, I hear some of the other women telling her husband, let's get out, let's get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Al, let's, uh, let's get you back to the last days of the war. You're still around southern Germany? Yeah. Um, what was it like in May 1945 when the war ended in Germany? When the war ended, uh, it, was, it was good for everybody. We were glad. And... Uh, I'm not especially medics, especially glad that we didn't have to look at that blood and guts all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was down in Marseille, France, transferred over there to a replacement depot. And uh, they had a ship there waiting. They were trying to load it with medics. Well. Once we got loaded, we, we thought we were headed out for home. Uh-uh, headed out for Pacific. We were going to the Pacific. We got one day off the canal, and they sent us back up, came into Boston, and then, then went down to the camp they had around Ton. Ton can't think of the name of that. Ta um, Camp Squanto? I can't, I, but I know which one you mean, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were going to be part of the invasion of Japan. Yeah. And then August 45 comes around, you hear about something called the atomic bomb and then what happened? <laughs> well, we were, uh, I don't know, we didn't say much about it. Mm -hmm. We were just glad that, that we weren't doing what we had done for almost a year. And uh, no, I, uh, I made, when I went in, I had no family. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I married, got married, that was my family. And her mother, just as soon, well, in the wedding, just as soon as we pronounced man and wife, she came over and gave me a hug. She says, I'm not losing a daughter, I'm gaining a son. So you stayed in the army, correct? Till uh, till I was discharged mm -hmm. in November of uh, '45, and then in January, mm -hmm. January 14th, '46, I went into the Air Force. Now, why the, uh, I know you couldn't go into the Navy, but why the Air Force? Well, uh, I figured I could go in the medics in the Air Force, but uh, uh, it worked out that when I first, my first assignment, when I got in the Air Force, Air Force Rescue. Oh. So, 
I was in there for about six months. And luckily, I didn't have to make any jumps, but mm -hmm. when they found out there, they mm -hmm. said, Pfft. so I went to an Air Force Intelligence. Mm -hmm. What was your- my way up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was till, about- uh, I was base sergeant major. Mm -hmm. That's what I retired as. So you mentioned some of the bases uh, where you were stationed. Uh, what were your main duties with Air Force Intelligence? No what were what were some of your duties with Air Force Intelligence? Oh, with Air Force Intelligence, one of them I was in charge of uh, their uh, base supply room, mm -hmm. and then the. Uh, they put me in charge of the uh, air safety. And uh, then I was in charge of personnel. Mm -hmm. And I was only a staff sergeant. And uh, base, I got a notice from the base commander that uh, he wanted to see me. So I go, uh oh, I said, I'm finally in big. <laughs> but uh, he said, no, he says, uh, I'm losing. My base sergeant major, he's retiring. And he says, I've looked all around. And he says, I can't find anything. And I just looked at him. But you, he said. He said, uh, he said, I know you're on your staff, but I can give you a, pro a primary uh, master, master. So that's how I made the man. He was a man that he and I could get together in his office. We'd take our jackets off. He said, okay, now, we're the man to man. And sometimes, sometimes his secretary found on the, what do you guys are doing? But we would holler, scream at each other. But if he decided that my, what I was talking about was the best, he'd do it. And how long were you in the Air Force? The Air Force? Mm -hmm. For uh, uh, January of uh, 64 mm -hmm. till, uh, no, 46. Thank you. <laughs> Until uh, July of 63. Okay. So you did mention Korea earlier. I, and I had, my wife and I, been married six months, just started the home, Korea. We were just six months. Mm -hmm. I went to Korea for two years. I done all intelligence, a lot of photo intelligence. Mm -hmm. And what that would do, we had aircraft two-seaters. They wanted a man up front for cameras. And uh, my, the division commander, he says, you're going to be number one. I said, why? What did I do now? He says, you know how to get out of a parachute. I said, how'd you find out? <laughs> He said, I'm not going to tell you all my secrets. <laughs> but uh, I know when I wrote home, I never told the wife I was doing flying status. So you said you were in Korea for two years. And while you were 
doing intelligence work in the plane, were you ever shot at? Did you ever see the oh, enemy? Yeah. yeah. We were shot at, but uh, we had some pilots. I knew two of them from there. They were at one base, and they had gone to pilot school. One of them was a stupid idiot. <laughs> he would go right down, almost touching, to get away. And to show you to say how much I knew him, he had a motorcycle. He'd go at night with a line of traffic going out. <laughs> yeah, he sounds like he could drive through Boston with no problems. Yeah. <laughs> so you were in uh, Korea until 53? Hmm? Uh, how long were you in Korea besides two years, like to 1953? Let's see, I went in in 50 uh -huh. and uh, got out of there in 52. Okay. And where were you sent after Korea? After Korea, let me see, we were in Maine. Uh, Virginia. Virginia, okay. Then to back to Maine, then uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma to Alaska, and then uh, uh, back down to uh, Maine. And just out of curiosity, where in Maine were you stationed? Dow Air Force Base, which is uh, Bangor. Bang. Turned into a uh, international, international air, air station mm -hmm. now. And during the times when you were stationed in Maine, Virginia, Oklahoma, and Alaska, were your duties pretty much the same Air Force intelligence? No, I wasn't using doing intelligence then. Mm -hmm. Then I got in. They uh, got into uh, records. Mm -hmm personal record business. And then I got into uh, uh, base uh, uh, material. And what was, that, what was that like? Just ordering up supplies or? What? Uh, what, what were your duties during this period? Uh, were you like ordering supplies and just taking care of personnel? Just, just done whatever I, I had to do. And, uh, but when they changed me from job to job, I requested the people in that area, I want to meet them with them. And I wanted the captain in charge or whatever he was rank with. Mm -hmm. I said, so I've got one thing I want. I said, I'm telling these people, you, if something happens, no matter what it is, let me know. Now, if you lie to me, I said, I'll hang you out to dry. But if you give me the truth, I'll fight all I can for you. And it worked out. Mm -hmm. Now, Al, uh, you said you left the service in 1963. Why did you do that? I retired. You retired, okay. I had, I had my 20 years in, and I uh, figured the, they had made some changes, and I would never get another uh, promotion. So I said, get out. Mm -hmm. And you said at the start of the interview that shortly afterward, you moved to Natick. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, what attracted you to Natick? Hmm? 
Oh, what made you move to Natick? Was it work? Well, uh, we had looked around and uh, we had spent uh, wondering of just and uh, happened to spot this place. And uh, so we decided to, to get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to, uh, let me say, I went to the computer work. And I went into trucking. And uh, the last job, newspaper business. Mm -hmm. No, when I won the last, last one it was just for about a year for Odessa over here. I mm -hmm. worked there. And what did you do at Odessa? Were you driving the cars? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Drive the cars in. And uh, up there, the uh, guy that was in charge and I got in an argument. And uh, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, don't worry about it. He said, what do you mean? I hand him the badge I had to have, the, the jacket I had to have. I said, see you later. And how long ago was that? Let's see, that was about, uh, uh, let me see now, about four, about five years, five years, uh, this last, I was sure, just shortly before I became 90. Okay. Long work career. So Al, last fall you had the opportunity to go back to Belgium for the 75th anniversary. And you also told me that you're going to be going to Normandy this coming June for the 75th of the end of World War II. Did you ever believe that you would live long enough to see the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Yeah, I, uh, uh, when I went to Bastogne this time, uh, in one way I didn't like it. Mm. And that was, no matter where I was, cameras at me be. Oh. And uh, I felt kind of guilty because the other fellows with us weren't getting the same thing that I was getting. Mm -hmm. And like they were, we had a monument for the uh, medics. Uh, that was taken out to that for the, that service. And the other fellows went somewhere else, but, mm -hmm. but they got a picture of me in a foxhole. Al, how important was it for you to serve in the military? To go in the military? Yes. I don't know. I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. It was just as I knew where I was working, mm -hmm. I was not going to get far. So I said, eh, maybe I can go see the world. And as I said before, I had no family that I could have talked to about it. So I had made my own decisions. And if I made the decisions, it was my fault, nobody else's. Mm -hmm. Well, Al, you certainly have seen the world. Uh, did any of your children or grandchildren join the military? Did they ever serve? No, one of my sons served in the Mar Marines okay. for a while, 
but he got out on a health discharge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told him, I always kid him about it. You go in the Marines, you're scared to jump. <laughs> and the, the one that applied about it, the young fella that has been in charge to the trip to uh, Bastogne and to going in, into uh, Normandy, a Marine. <laughs> Al, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we wrap up this interview? Hmm? Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap things up? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, Allison, Doc Blaney, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. And <laughs>